Welcome to Halting Toward Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson, here with Greg Ettinger and Brian Broom, and we've been talking about the promised land and the Israelites' journey thereinto from Egypt under the leadership of Moses and Joshua. Last week, we talked about the sin of Achan at Jericho and the Battle of Ai, and the consequences of defying the worship of God. And today we're talking about sort of an inverse story with Rahab, who was not an Israelite, uh, but became an Israelite, um, not by change of ethnicity, as if that were a thing, but by covenant. So Greg, why don't you tell us who Rahab is, how we find out about her, what happened to her, who is she? (laughs) (laughs) Wow, that was that was a lot, wasn't it? Well, Rahab, both testaments tell us, was a harlot. She was a prostitute. And not a fancy temple prostitute, she was just an ordinary whore. She had a house on the wall, so she was really easy to find if anyone wanted to ask, where's lodging and, uh, you know, other stuff? Someone could just kind of nod and all eyes go up and, oh, just keep walking the streets until I get there. This is relevant because two Israelite men show up in Jericho. They are spies. Now, something we usually bring up later, but now's a great time. Spies. (laughs) You know what? Spies deceive people. But that's wicked. they, They misrepresent themselves. They bear false witness concerning their identity and their motives and their intentions. The funny thing is that the spies never get any flack in this story. (laughs) But Rahab is one of the most criticized characters in in biblical literature because she's going to do exactly the same thing. She's going to switch sides in a battle, in a war. And in the process, she's going to deceive. She's going to flat out lie. She's going to lie very well, as a matter of fact. The lie actually works. We'll we'll get there in a moment. So in in that culture, there were no holiday inns or Ramada inns or whatever. And people were not necessarily terribly charitable to complete strangers. So if you wanted a place to stay for the night, an obvious place would be a house of ill repute. Horse house. Harlot's residence. Because no one's going to ask questions, and it's expected that a lot of strange people will be there. Well, these these spies, uh, having done whatever they thought they could do for the day, and they, they probably had come in a little late. Um, they don't seem to be there very long. Uh, but they they decide they're going to spend the night in this house with probably lots of other strangers. And they pi- they bypass the other services. No, we're not interested in going upstairs. We just want a place to lay down by a fire and we want something to eat. Can you see to that? These men were not professional spies. They had not been trained by the CIA or MI5 or (laughs) 6. And Rahab, who was a good reader of character, as someone in this profession must need to be if she's going to be successful, real fast reads them for what they are. All right, these are Israelites. We know about them. We've been told about them. The whole other bank of Jordan is swarming with them. It's not that far away. So there probably had been a few people who had made incursions already and been chased off. So she she's quick. Okay, these are Israelites. So when the king's guard, obviously these guys had done a really horrible job because everybody knows <laughs> they're in town and where they are. Not that that took much of a guess. But the king's guards come and say, Two men, spies, have come out of the camp of Israel. We believe they're here. We need you to turn them over to us. And this presents Rahab with a moment of decision, conviction. Uh, she really only has two things she can do, despite what people may tell you. She can say, no, they're not here. They went that way. Go chase them. Or she can say, well, I cannot tell a lie. They're on the roof right now, hidden under some stuff. But uh, you really should leave them alone because they're godly people. And, you know, God's going to get us and you should switch sides. Like I did kind of just now, except for the fact where I turned them over to you. 
<laughs> we, that we, would get you killed really <laughs> fast, <laughs> by the way. This, um, everyone comes up with other possibilities. Oh, like I would have Jews in my house. Ha, ha, ha. That's a non-answer. And it, yes, they're, they're, they're somewhere above my ceiling. Yeah, they actually are. We'll go. This, this isn't a yes, no question. This is a no wiggle room. You don't get to get cute with your language. You don't hope that God is somehow going to blind them once you've pointed out exactly where they, where these spies are. You're either going to turn them over or you're not. And she decides in that moment, or perhaps long before that moment, that she is going to hide them, conceal them, and lie about them. What she says to the guards is this. There came men unto me, but I, I wist not whence they were. I didn't know where they came from. And it came to pass about the time of the shutting of the gate, when it was dark, that the men went out. Whither the men went, I, I wot not. I don't know where they went. Pursue after them quickly, for you shall overtake them. <laughs> it sounds like she just gave them a lot of information. She basically told them nothing. Yeah, there were some men here. Um, I don't know if they were your spies. If they were, I didn't know it. I, I'm not. Don't don't blame me. I. They were. They carried it off pretty well. If they were spies, but uh, yeah, they there were some guys here. And about the time the gate was being shut, maybe a little before the laughter, right? I don't know. You know, they may have made it out the gate. They may not. I can't know. I don't. Um, the um, it's kind of a ju funny juxtaposition between I don't know which way they went, but definitely go after them. I'm sure you'll find them. Yeah, <laughs> like, go where? <laughs> yeah, and it was uh, it was dark. So even had I looked to see which way they went, it was dark, and I would not have seen them. But and so I don't know where they went. But go after them quickly. I'm sure you'll overtake them. Again, at first glance, it sounds like she's told them a lot, but she told them absolutely nothing except maybe they were here and they're not here now if they were. <laughs> maybe there and, was a little flattery in that, like, oh, uh, you guys are so strong and brave and good at <laughs> catching people. I'm sure you'll get them. Yeah. Whatever <laughs> she, whatever um, English she put on it, they bought it and they, they, they pursued all the way to the Ford. So they probably, they probably thought, okay, worst case scenario, they got out when the gate was open. They'd make a beeline for the fords because that's the only way across. Jordan's uh, overflowing its banks just about this time. So it's the shallowest spot. It's not a great spot to cross. We get there. Oh, we're here and they're not. Well, hmm. So, dumb luck. They're God's power. Don't say that when the boss is listening. Um, well, let's kind of look around a little bit so we can say that maybe they never got out. Maybe they're still in the city and the other guys will find them. No, no. We, we, we did what we were supposed to do. We were good guards. Uh, wasn't that lady helpful and nice? Yeah, she sure was. <laughs> Meanwhile, Rahab has taken the two spies and brought them to the top of her roof. The text says she hid them with the stalks of flax, which she had laid in order upon the roof to dry. Um, and when the guards are gone and everything's calmed down, she comes to the spies and, and makes a confession. And this is the longest speech to this point that any female in Scripture has given. And it's one of the longest that, that any woman gets in Scripture. And it's pivotal for what happens. She says this, I know that the Lord has given you the land. And that your terror is fallen upon us, and that all the inhabitants of the land faint because of you. For we have heard how the Lord, Yahweh, dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt. And what you did to the two kings of the Amorites that were on the other side of Jordan, Sihon and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. And as soon as we had heard these things, our hearts did melt. Neither did there remain any more courage in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, Yahweh, your Elohim, he is God in heaven above and in earth beneath. Now, therefore, I pray you swear unto me by the Lord, by Yahweh, since I have showed you kindness, chesed, covenant mercy, that you will also show kindness, chesed, unto my father's house, 
and give me a true token that you will save alive my father, my brother, or my mother, my brother, my sisters, and, and all that they have and deliver our lives from death. Okay, that's the speech. It's long. Notice some of the things she says. First of all, she acknowledges God's absolute sovereignty. It's, it's not just some God yet to be named. It is uh, Yahweh. It is the God of Israel, Jehovah, the covenant-keeping God who has, in fact, a name that everybody knows. He is God in heaven and on earth. His, his sovereignty is universal. For a polytheist, this is an amazing statement. Polytheists did not believe in sovereign gods that controlled everything. She has rejected the polytheism of her community, of her family, of her ancestors, and is embracing the idea of a personal theistic God who is, in fact, sovereign over the entire universe. And he is a God who acts in history, and he has done great things, and he's act outside of territorial boundaries. He was active in bringing him through the boundary of Egypt, the Red Sea. He took out the two kings on the other side of Jordan, Sihon and Og, who were powerful warriors. And everybody knows this. This is not a thing done in a secret. This is not something that's uh, that only the king's uh, intelligence agency knows about it. Everybody, so this has been headline news. Everybody knows about this. With the result, she says, our hearts did melt, neither did there remain any courage in any man because of you, because of the nature of your God. He's God in heaven above and, and earth beneath. He's your God. That's a pretty wonderful confession of faith. Now, she lived in an era before the coming of Christ, obviously. We don't know if she knew exactly the nature of God's promise to Abraham or how much of the seed of the woman thing she knew. But she understands something very clearly. There's a war here, and you have to pick the right side. And the side that her city was on was about to go up in smoke. She wanted to be on the other side, and she wanted to be on it, not simply because it was the winning side, because, but because it was the side of the God who made heaven and earth. And in that sense, it was the right side. No argument about that. And because of this, she was willing to take a huge risk. She's already lied to the guards. She's going to help these spies get out of town now. In exchange for this, and she calls it, as I said, chesed, covenant mercy, loving kindness, some translations say. It's, it's the kind of mercy that's reflected. Uh, it's a reflection of some kind of personal relationship. Really, that's flat out. Covenant. Well, she hasn't exactly entered the co a covenant with Israel, but she's suggesting that that's kind of what she has in mind here. Because she wants an oath. Swear to me by the Lord, not by her gods, not by her city's gods. Swear by the name of Jehovah that you will show covenant mercy to me and my family. And, and she's thinking covenantally here. Not just to me. I went out of this alive with my skin, but my family too. Now, Prostitutes are not popular people in any culture. And the a prostitute's family is not necessarily um, on good terms with her. And we're not told what the relationship was here. We have no way of knowing. But whatever it was, she instantly includes her, her dad and mom and brothers and sisters and all that they have in case she's missed anybody. Presumably that would include... Other dependents, in-laws, <laughs> in servants, whoever, the cat and the dog, whatever, that they can fit in this house. I want you to swear by your God that they will be in a neutral, safe zone, that when this city falls, they'll be safe, that they will live, and that I will live. If you give me that, I'll help you get out of here alive. So, it's interesting that it's her family and not, say, her and her three best friends or her and mm. the women in her employ. It's people with whom she also has a covenant relationship with. Yeah, she is thinking covenantally. You know, we, we would, oftentimes we tend to elevate people we work with or next to a neighbor, people go to school with, best friends. They're like family. I understand what that means. And, and to say that's not a bad thing in and of itself. But uh, there's a difference covenantally. Covenant is... Uh, is a shared life bound by oath, and therefore potentially by blood. Uh, it's, it's a covenant to life and death. The uh, the formula, I would take a bullet for that guy. It's something like that, if not stronger. Not just, yeah, these are my friends I get drunk with. Oh, these are the people I will die for. 
uh, and they will die for me. There's that kind of commitment involved here. And so, yeah, <laughs> she falls back on her family, not the girls in her employ, certainly none of her customers, not the city officials uh, with whom she did sustain. I mean, in some sense, she can st she sustained a covenant relationship with all these people. They all belong to the same city. But her family has priority in her thinking and in her emotions. And that's her deal. The men respond, our life for yours, if you utter not this our business. It shall be when the Lord hath given us the land that we will deal kindly and truly with thee. And she let them down by a cord through the window. Her house was on the wall. She said, tells them, get to the mountain. Stay there three days until you, the pursuers have come back. And the men say, we will be blameless of this thine oath, which thou hast made us swear. Behold, when we come into the land, thou shalt bind this line of a scarlet thread in the window, which thou didst let us down by. And then bring all your family and everybody here. Anybody who's inside, they'll be safe. They're outside, the blood's on their head. And if you blab on us, if you give any of this away, then the deal's gone. And she agrees. And they go their way, and she binds the scarlet line in the window. It's, it's been interesting to me um, how many people have missed the scarlet line thing. It used to be a favorite theme of, of preachers of all sorts. And, and preachers and commentators would talk about the scarlet line that runs through Scripture, referring to the blood of Christ as the common theme. Uh, others, I suspect, either just don't notice or would say, oh, you're reading way too much into it. It just says it's red. It wasn't like it's really blood. Well, 40 years before, when the children of Israel were ready to leave Egypt, the houses that were going to be saved were themselves marked with scarlet, with red blood, blood of the lamb. Now, that in itself is an interesting coincidence, but what's far more of a coincidence is it's Passover season. The children of Israel just got themselves circumcised so they can celebrate Passover. They'd cross Jordan on the 10th of Nisan, or 10th of Abib. So it is Passover season, and they're saying, here, mark your head, mark your house with red, and the vengeance of God will pass over you. So there are extensive echoes of, of covenant incorporation. And that's if very practical, too. I mean, and when the avenging forces of Israel come through, and it's Passover season, and they see a, a threshold marked with red, I don't think they're going to be like, ah, I'm sure it's fine. Just walk in and kill them. <laughs> like, I don't think that's going to happen. Yeah, presumably they will remember their own heritage and uh, honor the stories that they either remember from when they were very young, having lived, lived through it, or that they were told on their mother's knees if they were very small or born in during the 40 years of wandering. Uh, now, of course, Rahab runs something of a risk here because she probably didn't normally have a red line flying from her window. Um, Unnecessary because her house was already known. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I just, I just put it up there so people could find the place more easily. What do you think? Passion statement? Uh, it's not like putting pink fl plastic flamingos on your lawn. <laughs> it's, it's an odd thing. And uh, it, it, there was the possibility. I mean, the house, the house had been noticed. The, the, the police had been there. Uh, I, I'm reminded suddenly of all of those British detective mysteries where the remark is, they had the police at their house, <laughs> which at one point in Britain apparently was uh, a sign of being uncultured and, and, and outside the pale. The police, the bobbies, had been at their house. <laughs> well, nice people don't have the police come to nice their house. Nice people houses. don't have the police come to their house, but she had. And so here's, here's something, again, a little bit odd, and she may have to invent some stories. But whatever the case, she waits. The two spies, this was the extent of their spying. They got into Jericho, went to her house, almost got arrested. She pours out this testimony of how great God is and how fearful the Canaanites are. And then she gets them out and they go back. And they came to Joshua and <laughs> say, we got it, boss. The land's ours. They really compare this with the other spies 40 years earlier. 
and spied out the land of whom Joshua and Caleb are two. They did a much more thorough job. They brought back the fruit of the land, you know, the huge bit of grapes. They had details about walled cities and giants. They spent 40 days spying out the, the place. These guys spent like a day or two. And yet what God handed them from the mouth of one single woman and a prostitute was enough to encourage Joshua to do the next thing. He already had God's command. He didn't feel he needed anything else at this point. They're terrified. They know, they're telling us that God's given us the land. They're witnesses to God's covenant promises. There's no reason we can't go forward now. He just, thanks guys, good job. Make sure you rescue her when the time comes. Let's let's begin the battle. And we've already talked about the Battle of Jericho and, and that whole elaborate thing. Oh, can I make one more point about sure. the Scarlet Thread? Yeah. So the, the people of Israel have taken over the job of the angel of death. Yes. So there's been a delegation of <laughs> duty. <laughs> so. Yeah, the holy war has now progressed to the point where God has put the sword in the hands of his people, they are now angels of death to this city that they're about to conquer. By the way, angel of death, sorry, this is a little bit of a tangent. Yeah. That's Jesus, right? And I think the text just says angel, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I, I don't think it actually says angel of death, now that you mentioned it. Yeah. And I remember someone bringing it up before and looking and, and, and seeing. Uh, it's it's the angel of the Lord. Um and I, I, I wish I knew Hebrew. I don't. And so there are a couple of phrases there. I think that Passover means to skip. Mm -hmm. It could mean that God passes over the house and sends the angel packing as it comes along. Um, and, and because mm -hmm. of my weak knowledge of Hebrew, and because I can't remember what I've read from other people who can speak Hebrew, I, I'm not positive, but I think it's the... I think it's a traditional and God will skip, in which case, yes, then it's the angel. Of, the angel of the Lord is doing the Passovering, whatever that means. And if he's the one who's actually laying waste, then yeah, that's Jesus. And he's he's bringing destruction, which from our point of view, we belong to the Lord. We are members of his host. He's the Lord of hosts. He has angelic hosts, but he has earthly hosts. And we are to follow in his train. Revelation 19, when he's on the white horse, streaming through history, slaying the nations with the sword of his mouth, the armies that are in heaven are not simply angels, it's, it's the church militant as we follow in his wake, in this case, swinging the sword of the spirit. Uh, it's Jesus' war, and that's that's the thing we have to keep coming back to. And, and this is a good point to reemphasize what you already said. The issue here is not ethnicity. Rahab is a Canaanite. That means she's Hemetic by descent. Uh, the Canaanites are related to the Ethiopians, Opians. The Canaanites are, were a dark haired, darker, darker skinned sort of people. Uh, the Ethiopians, the Kushites were darker still. None of that is relevant to this discussion. What's relevant is that these people worship false gods. They worship Baal and Ashtaroth. They worship nature. And that's what that's what made the city what it was. Cities in the ancient world were religious institutions founded around the crypt of some ancestor who had been deified. The walls were spelled out magically and represented the extent of the shrine and of the worship. And if you, to be a citizen, you had to worship that God. And anyone who didn't and who did not belong were aliens and in that sense monsters, outsiders and did not receive the protection except in a very superficial sense of the city and its laws. This is a covenanted community based on religion, based on a particular sort of worship. And that's what she's breaking with. And she's siding with a God whose demands are universal. They're not li limited to one little city. They encompass the whole world. And the commander of the army is the Messiah, is Michael the Archangel, is Jesus Christ. Um, second person of the Trinity. So that's the allegiance here. And the fact that most of the people on one side were of one ethnicity and most of the people on the other were another is irrelevant to, to this tale. 
Because what we're seeing here is, despite her ethnicity, she switched sides and no one said, wait a minute, who are your grandparents? What's your DNA? What's your blood type? What kind of, <laughs> who we, that's not Yeah, you had Egyptians there. in with the Israelites as well. Yeah, yeah. There were, there, there were Egyptians. And if you remember back, Tamar's, yeah, Tamar's children, Judah's children by Tamar. Tamar was a Canaanite. In the tribe of Judah, in the Messianic line, there was Canaanite blood already. And Rahab's going to marry back into this line of Judah. And she's going to become blah, 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 an ancestress of Jesus Christ, uh, which, which horrifies some people, but is no problem to Christians who understand that salvation is by grace, not by some kind of mythical race thing. Anyway, Joshua tells the spies, go to the harlot's house, bring out thence the woman and all that she hath, as you swear to her. And the young men that were spies went in and brought out Rahab and her father and her mother and her brother and all that she had. And they brought out all her kindred and left them without the camp of Israel, they burnt the city with fire. Joshua saved Rahab the harlot alive and her father's household and all that she had. And she dwelleth in Israel even unto this day. And presumably that's Joshua writing in his old age, because she hid the messengers which Joshua spit, sent to spy out the land. So Joshua Note, didn't say, I didn't make that deal. I'm not bound by it. No. <laughs> he said, as you've done to my spies, you've done to me. <laughs> done, yes. Sounds familiar from someplace. <laughs> someplace we've heard before. Yeah. Or after. Firefly? <laughs> no. Um, because there she, is that she, episode of Firefly, though. That's when, like, the, the whole passage about, as you've done to the least of these, my brothers, you've done to me. That's when that passage really made sense to me, is when I watched the episode of Firefly, where the captain of the ship uh, defends members of his crew using just that line. You did it to my crew, you did it to me. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> random. There we go. Uh, because she hid the messengers, not because she didn't turn them over, because she hid them. She concealed them from those who in that culture had the lawful authority to ask, where are they? Show them to us, reveal them. She hid them. And part of the hiding was necessarily lying about where they were. Uh, it wouldn't have done any good for her to hide them and then say, well, they're here, but they're hidden. Bet you can't find them. <laughs> it's, no, there's no way that works. Now, I said earlier that this Rahab and her, her actions have been criticized more than, than just about anybody. And it, it turns on this question of her lie. Uh, some people have, some commentators have tried to water it down by using other words, by prevaricating on, on their... Uh, <laughs> about what she did. What, what is, what's the phrase? What's the word when you when you quibble is not the word. There's a fancy word for quibble. Equivocate. Equivocate will do. There's another word and I can't think of it right now. Uh, on the word lie. She didn't exactly lie. She, yes, she did. Uh, she said they went that way when in fact they were on the roof and she knew that. Now, with that in mind, we should, we need to look at the New Testament references. First of all, let us note that there are New Testament references. <laughs> and not just one, but two. The first one that probably, I don't know what people think of, I think of Hebrews first. Because in Hebrews 11, we have a whole list of people who were justified by faith. But in each case, their faith was exemplified by something they did. And in most cases, something a little weird and, in fact, and sometimes completely outrageous, uh, sometimes something very costly, building a boat in the middle of nowhere, giving God a dead animal, um, forsaking the, the, the title to emperor, uh, walking around a city uh, many, many times, hoping it would fall. And in the midst of this, we have Rahab, and it says this. This is chapter 11 of Hebrews, verse 31. By faith, the harlot Rahab perished not with him to believe not when she'd received the spies with peace. So first of all, notice that the writer is drawing the line with regard to her faith, not her ethnic identity, not her DNA, not her genes and chromosomes, um, not even her, her address or zip code 
or education or anything like that. It has to do with she believed they didn't. Um, by faith, she it was her faith that kept her from dying. What did she do? She received the spies with peace. Now, you could really try to force that and say, yeah, the spies came in and she didn't immediately kill them. And that's all the writers commending, that she didn't kill them. But anything that happens after that, we can't put on God because, you know, should not bear false witness. God does not approve of lying. So she's a guilty very for that. Negative conception of peace, which is not biblical yeah. either. Not and killing someone is not being at peace with them. That's not exactly. the same thing. Exactly. Thank you. That's where I was going and I was getting lost. Um, <laughs> that's what I was. That was my, my original intention. I forgot what I was what I meant to do with that. Exactly. Peace is not simply not killing somebody. Peace, shalom, in a biblical sense is comfort, safety, protection, health, well-being, uh, a loving friendship, attitude for fellowship. friendship. Yeah, all of yep. that goes into it. That's what she brought them into. And to, ha to have done that and then say, well, guys, you know, it's been a great 10 minutes, but there are guards at the door and they're going to, to grab you and take you away and torture you. Um, hope to see you in heaven. Bye. Yeah, wasn't me. <laughs> Oh, and do you think you can put in a good way? Uh, well, it's a little late for that, I guess. <laughs> she would have died with everyone else had she done that. And the only way for her to escape was for those spies to get back to Joshua. Because as much as they might promise, they're not in charge. They're not the ones who can tell every single soldier, let this woman live. So she has to get them back. She has to not only receive them for a few moments and serve them tea and crumpets, she has to get them safely back home again. Those have to be the peace terms if she's going to continue in peace. So to, to say that she didn't kill them, but she did have to give them up and she should have, and, and that was a failure of faith. No, that the text won't bear that. But the other passage... Susan James. And and yes, here is a woman of faith who gets two mentions in the New Testament. There are not many who there aren't many that there aren't really that many saints, Old Testament saints, who get mentioned by name in the New Testament. And most of them show up in Hebrews eleven, actually. Mm -hmm. There are a few others, but a lot of it is just repetition of names we know so well. Well, Abraham. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's um, that's yeah, most of it, right? That's there. <laughs> most of it, right there. Uh, Moses, yeah, uh, David a few times, uh, but this this woman in both of these chapters that have to do with the nature of saving faith and and the evidence of faith in one's life, and the works that faith necessarily produces. Uh, Sarah gets gets mentioned in Hebrews. She's the only other woman in Hebrews eleven. Here, it's just Rahab and Abraham. And um, here in, in James chapter 2, we're told, um, likewise also was not Rahab the harlot justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out another way. We've talked about this before, and I don't know that we need to go through it all again. The idea is not justified before God in... Um, in a forensic sense, it means that her good works justified her before men in that they evidenced that she had a living faith, faith without works is dead, which is what he has just said. Uh, and what he's about to say, for this, the body without spirit, without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead. This is a uh, medical analysis of, of faith. Is it alive? Is it functioning? Well, has it done anything? <laughs> and Rahab's faith had done something. What had it done? Received the messengers and sent them out another way. Another way from what? Probably another way from the way she told the guards. She told the guards they went that way, and she sent them out another way over the wall, which by itself was a treasonable act, by the way, since the walls performed the magic protection of the city. Um, so again, the the emphasis here, this is a battle situation. And that, that's something a lot of people really have trouble pro uh, processing. 
this is war. I, there was a, a young husband and wife who had a kid in their school. And one of the teachers, and I think it actually was my wife, maybe not though, had been talking about this passage. And they'd gotten upset. We're afraid that our son's going to get the idea that, that, that it's okay to lie. And I talked to them. I said, first of all, no, he won't. He knows the difference. He's not stupid. But secondly, I looked at the, at the husband. Have you ever served in the military? No. Okay. Well, if you had, you would know very well that soldiers in combat, soldiers who are being shot at, do something. They conceal their location and identity. They hide. They deceive. They lie. Because at that point, people are trying to kill them. And in fact, they're probably trying to kill somebody else. Imagine a war where we're free to kill each other, where we shouldn't lie to each other. <sighs> Sometimes the very act of lying to each other means that you don't have to kill them. If I don't let you know who I am, you know, you, you know the old bit, if I told you what I did, I'd have to kill you. <laughs> you know, on the battlefield, that may be true. With spies, that may be true. Uh, if, I tell, if I actually told you the truth, I'd end up killing you. Yes, but you should always tell the truth. Killing is secondary. Um, God has a different opinion when it comes to the Hebrew midwives explicitly. Like there are several instances of deception for the sake of the covenant of God. And in that one, God says, and God blessed and approved of what they did. Yeah, God built them houses. And well, you're dealing, like you said, you're dealing with war. Uh, mm -hmm. If you look at the, at the sixth commandment, uh, or I don't know how other traditions that are Protestant yeah. number them, but uh, the reform generally call it number six. Thou shalt not kill. They went to war a lot, and yeah. they fought each other a lot. There are there are clear, honestly common sense exceptions mm -hmm. to most of the commandments. Not all of them. You know, I, I'm I'm hard pressed to think of a of a exception to you shall have no other gods before me but uh, yeah, i don't think you can do that one you um, know but some of the, some of the ones on the second table certainly have their exceptions i mean even um, there are times when it is right to hate father and mother for the kingdom of god's mm -hmm. sake yeah. precisely there are times and, when you do things that look like violations of the sabbath law but in fact are keeping with the sabbath and, and there's the point i think we need to make yeah it's not that we're discarding the commandments and thinking, oh, that commandment doesn't doesn't really apply. What we're doing often is, is that we've missed what the commandment really means. Mm -hmm. Thou shalt not kill. I that means I am to protect my own life and the life of my family and my neighbors and my country against bad guys. And if the bad guys are coming and yelling and screaming and have guns and pointy sticks and things, it is loving. I am loving my family. I am protecting their lives by turning my gun. On the bad guys. And it, not to it, mention, even if your own nation is wicked yeah. and unjustly taking lives, it's your duty to not follow through with the orders of your superiors. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and you can do this with the, um, well, we're, we're doing it here. When you are at war, better to lie to somebody than to kill them, but you might have to do both because this is war. And it's a messy life or death matter. Now, the Hebrew midwives were not fighting a shooting war, but they were trying to save the lives of innocent children. And they did so by telling really weak, stupid lies that they <laughs> that made work. somehow worked. <laughs> yeah, uh, that, that's a story in itself. Uh, this is, is this a prescription for everyday life? Do you, are we supposed to teach our small children? Well, sometimes it may be necessary to lie to mommy and daddy. No, we can't <laughs> do that. And, that's, and, and I have never met a child uh, who was being taught this lesson who made that mistake. Mm -hmm. And I've rarely met, met an adult who's made that mistake for that matter. It's pretty clear. Uh, when, once you say it's war, and once you say spies and soldiers, no one really questions this. It's because she's a woman and she's not a soldier and she's not a spy that this even comes up. I'm sorry, there yeah. is a good deal of sexism involved in the criticisms of Rahab. We can think here of jail. She gets so much flack 
from the commentators. One uh, Bible uh, translation version even has as the the headline for that chapter, the murderous JL. What? Really? If this were, yeah, if this were David or Gideon or, or someone like that, it wouldn't even come up because she's a woman. And then when we point to Deborah's prophecy, oh, her. Yeah, her. She's a prophetess. <laughs> she speaks the word of God. No one would question if it were if it were Isaiah, Ezekiel, or Daniel. But because it's only Deborah, well, that probably wasn't really the word of God when you come into jail. Um, there, there's a certain degree of sexism that some commentators bring to Scripture that is inexcusable when the Bible very clearly tells us, no, she did a good thing. This was war, and in war, this is what you do. And it's what you would do, men, if you were at war, and you should know that, and it's what you should want your wives and daughters to do if they're caught in this kind of situation. In some cases, it's because the men were not doing their job that the women were put in this position. Yeah. And right. That yeah. would be an interesting uh, essay or discussion all by itself. How far is it pressing semantics to consider the language of uh, the Ninth Commandment, Ninth in the Reformed Reckoning? Um, <laughs> you shall not bear false witness against thy neighbor versus lying in general. Is that more yeah, specific? The- the commandment, as it's phrased so classically by God himself, tells us not to bear false witness. The implication is we are to bear true witness. Mm-hmm. Neither of those is, is quite the same as saying thou shalt not lie. Now, there are many places where God condemns lying in certain terms. And he tells mm-hmm. that because he is the truth. Right? He is the truth. And believers are told, lie be not one to another. He remembers one of another. So we, we need to be careful in, in putting too much wait on that, but I think we can get to this. The emphasis of the commandment is not lying in the abstract. As it's phrased, the emphasis of the commandment is protecting our neighbor's reputation, particularly in public setting or in court. That's the main emphasis. Yes, there's there's trickle down for that to be sure. Mm -hmm. You you could even say that it's it's a, a matter of lying being prohibited as something which brings harm to your neighbor. Yeah. That's the, that's the focus of the Ninth Commandment as it stands. Now, again, are there other implications? Of course there are. But we're talking about the way God himself chose to emphasize it. And that's the emphasis. Protect life, protect property, protect reputation. Well, if you are going to protect the reputation, doesn't that mean there are some things that unless you are asking court, you probably shouldn't talk about? You should avoid. You should step around. And if you're going to protect reputation, how much more life? If she, if it's wrong for her to slander, say, despise, then isn't it wrong for her to put them where they can be executed for espionage? Shouldn't her concern for their reputation escalate into concern for preserving their lives from wicked men who are trying to kill them? We need to see the law as, as a seamless whole whose emphasis is upon love, respecting the image of God, respecting what God wants for us and in us as his whole revelation demands it. Now, most of the time, yeah, obviously, and we're not here promoting lying as a lifestyle. No. But there are times when people, one, don't need to know everything. Don't too. Don't deserve <laughs> to know everything. Even Think about the road they, to Emmaus. Well, what yeah, things? one of my favorite lines in all of scripture. <laughs> Um, the, the disciples on the road to Emmaus most certainly would have liked to know who Jesus was. I mean, they were talking about him, about him, how he was the one who should have redeemed Israel. They were excited and heard about the tomb being empty. They really, really would have wanted to know that Jesus, that the stranger walking beside them was Jesus. And so when Jesus asked them, what are you talking about? Haven't you heard about the things that just happened in Jerusalem? And Jesus says, what things? <laughs> now, I do not know how you cannot say that Jesus is misleading, how you cannot say that he's misleading them. What things to me implies. I don't know what you're talking me, about. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. 
he's not lying in any direct sense. They, he has, he's under no obligation to let them know who he is, to tell them what he knows, or to reveal himself ahead of his father's timetable. The question is not a flat out lie. It's a question. What things? But it is nonetheless misleading from their point of view. And if my, one of my daughters tried that on me about <laughs> something else where I had a right to know, what things that? No, no, no. No, <laughs> no you're not doing that one. Uh, and, and you can think also while we're on the topic of the time when uh, uh, God sends uh, Samuel to anoint David. Mm. And Samuel, uh, yeah, Samuel says to the Lord, well, I can't do that. Saul, if Saul finds out about it, he'll kill me. Well, right. then take an animal and say you're going to sacrifice. Well, the moment God told him to, then of course he was going to sacrifice <laughs> secondarily. But his main reason was something else. And God has told him, I'm giving you a second job so you can tell him the second thing. Not tell him the first thing, not tell him the important reason, even though he would really love to know that reason. And he's the king of Israel. Mm -hmm. He doesn't even know that one. And, and that's since you are deceiving him. And God who is the proves. prophet to who, who uh, told the king of Israel? God said to tell the king of Israel that he was going to die, but he was going to recover or vice versa. Sorry, I'm mixing that oh, up. It was the king of Syria, actually. Oh. Uh, Elisha comes... To, to Syria, his mission is to anoint um, Haziel, king of Syria. So he comes and Haziel at this point is a servitor for, uh, for the king, who works for the king. And the king says, well, Elisha's in town. Go talk to him. Ask him if, if I'll be well, if I'll get healed of this disease. And Haziel comes with lots of presents, camels, foals of presents and such, and says, my master says, will I get well? And Elisha looks and says, you can tell him he's going to get well. And then Elisha starts crying. Mm -hmm. And he just says, what's wrong? Um, well, actually, be before that, he says, he will, um, thou mayest certainly, you shall t say to him, thou mayest certainly recover. How be it the Lord has showed me that he will surely die. And then he starts crying. And he says, why are you crying? Because I know the evil you're going to do, how you're going to destroy the frontier towns and live with the little children and all of that. What is your servant a dog that he should do such things? God has showed me that you will be king of Syria. And so as it goes back in, it's, what did what did the prophet say? Oh, he said you can get better. And then he assassinates him. Okay, the prophet <laughs> said you can tell him he's going to recover, presumably because he would not die of the disease. <laughs> the disease was not a fatal one. But he was not going to get better, and the prophet leaves it at that. Yes, Again, we have example after example after yeah. example of the bigger picture of God's purposes kind of yeah. overriding the immediate, overriding the, literalistic I, reading. I never tell a lie, rather than the pride yeah. and self-righteousness that says, I've never lied about anything. Well, one, you just did when you <laughs> said that. Um, we are all liars by nature. But there are people, again, there are people who do not deserve to know the truth, who have no claim on the truth, and who for their sake or the sake of the gospel or the sake of the church or the safety of your neighbor or family need to believe something that isn't true. And it may be your job to lead them down that road. Those are well, exceptional I mean, things, mm -hmm. but they become less and less exceptional during war or times of bloody persecution. Yeah, yeah. and I, it, it really comes down to what are the the higher priority things which is uh, yes god is truth but when you have people whose lifestyles and goals their ideology the way that they interact with society and if god help you if they're in power um and it's lived out in such a way that is contrary to god's law to the flourishing of human society and you're still hung up about you know lying to them unfortunately you're going to have to make a choice at some point and i hope that you come to the right conclusion between whether being truthful 
to the Nazi at your door is as important as letting them kill the Jew that you were hiding. And it's a it's a very real life or death type of situation. Like you're saying, it's exceptional. Less exceptional in war. World War II. It's obviously a war. It's in the name. <laughs> it's so important. And uh, I've been thinking about this anecdote, anecdote while we've been talking about this. There was a discussion in a certain, um, at least nominally reformed Facebook group that um, I, I think Emily at least is aware of. And the discussion came up about whether it's okay to lie to Nazis when you're hiding Jews. And a lot of people were saying that it's not okay because God is truth. Mm -hmm. And I can't imagine a more poignant example of missing the point. Yeah. How about God is love and God is life? This is this danger of picking one attribute of God and tearing it away from all that he is. And making an idol of it. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's a simplistic way of looking at the faith. And yet again, lay, leading on this note, these are exceptions. These are, mm -hmm. by and large, in most circumstances, rare things. But our fear is that in the generation coming, it may not be so rare. Mm -hmm. um, and God we Edward. needn't slander the saints who came before us yeah, by God. condemning their actions when God does not do so. When God does not do so. God Absolutely. have mercy on us. Indeed. All right. Well, we've been ending on cheery notes lately. <laughs> not at all, actually. <laughs> but um, let's have some recommendations. Um, I'm going to recommend... LaCroix, the limoncello flavor. <laughs> I'm not really into LaCroix in general. I always kind of laughed at my millennial um, classmates and such. Who It's like, is water not good enough for you? <laughs> like, <laughs> but it's been really helping me out lately. And so I appreciate limoncello LaCroix. <laughs> My That's youngest daughter would that. approve. <laughs> She's all into mineral, sparkling mineral water right now. <laughs> Brian, do you have anything? Oh, yes. Um, I recently watched a few movies with Emily that were quite good. Not me, One Emily. I... <laughs> Fiance Emily. Yes. <laughs> One of them I, I, I hadn't ever seen before. It was, it was big and famous and popular when it came out because um, it was directed by John Krasinski. It's called A Quiet Place. It is a Ooh. horror slash tension thriller. I it doesn't quite fit the the standard stereotypes of horror where you think of you know Friday the Thirteenth or Halloween where it's like slasher flicks and uh, teenagers being murdered. Not that kind of thing. It's more. <laughs> it's more. I'd say it's closer to Signs, uh, the, mm -hmm. the Mel Gibson movie. That was. Funny. Um, and basically, in, in this particular case, anyway the monsters that have invaded the world and you never know where they come from. According to the first movie, there is a sequel I haven't seen. So maybe they explain it there. I kind of hope they don't because it, it, remo it, storytelling wise, <laughs> don't show it the removes <laughs> the mystique. Where yes. did these come from? We don't know. Just they're there. Um, and they are able to pick up the slightest sound. And so it's a, every, everywhere mm. is a quiet place. And so if you make, a noise if you drop a um a rock on a hardwood floor they can hear that from a mile away and come chase you and uh they're it's very terrifying it's very tense but it's very very well put together and i was talking with my fiance emily uh about <laughs> how when the movie came out like the, the whole movie is uh these these people who are basically homesteading and like everyone who was vaguely traditionalist was like this is our this movie is our anthem and they were you know they're they're hollywood people they're they're vaguely not i wouldn't say like they're, they're on the far end of the liberal spectrum but they're still hollywood and they're like no 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 that's not what we were trying to say at all <laughs> like, too late we've, we've taken your movie and we've run with it <laughs> So a quiet place is my recommendation. As usual, I talk too much about my recommendations, but it was very good. <laughs> well, thank you. We appreciate that. I'm going to recommend 
uh, a book and movie, and the book over the movie, as is the way of things. It's called 84 Charing Cross Road. Oh, I've heard this title so much, and I don't know anything about the book. I always thought it was, it's, it's written as a series of letters. Obviously, it was fiction until I found out it wasn't. No. Oh. It's the, the story of a New York scriptwriter, a woman, uh, back uh, shortly, I think it starts in the late 50s, who loves antique books, old books, classic books, and can't find them in New York in any kind of decent edition. And she discovers an English bookshop, and so she begins communicating by post overseas with a bookstore on 84 Check Cross Road. Uh, and it's just the correspondence back and forth between this woman who has a wicked sense of humor uh, <laughs> and the very proper, humble British bookseller who tries to find her whatever she needs. If you love books, old books, rare books, you will love this. If you don't, there may be a problem. <laughs> because she's asking for things like the Latin Vulgate and uh, Pep's Diary and just uh, things that the modern American might consider obscure that, frankly, may never have heard of. Um, but... Uh, the the other thing is it's just it's narrative back and forth by use by use of letters and we get to know the woman we get to know the bookseller and the other people at the bookselling establishment the bookstore and we follow their growing friendship over a number of years I won't tell you how it ends there is an ending uh, and it's it's just charming and it's fun uh, it's good talk about books and uh, how people fit books into their priority list, let us say. Uh, it was uh, turned into a movie starring Anne Bancroft and I believe Anthony Hopkins, which is a little more Hollywoodish than than the, uh, the book itself. But it's fun. And again, if you like if you like talking about books, if you like a um, book and a movie about people who love books, you probably <laughs> will enjoy this. 84 Train Crossroad. I do find it funny how many books I pick up that are about writers or people who <laughs> like books because yeah. I guess write what you know is the yeah. law. <laughs> so, well, thank you very much. I will have to check that out. Thank you guys both so much for this conversation. It's been a pleasure. Even though we don't end on happy notes all the time, it's always edifying. <laughs> uh, thanks also to David, our producer, and my lawfully wedded husband. Thank you to you, our listeners. Uh, if you'd like to get in touch with us, you can email us at haltingtowardsion at gmail.com. You can like our Facebook page. You can subscribe to us on YouTube or Rumble. And uh, if you'd like to join the numbers of our financial supporters, you can visit our website, anchor.fm slash haltingtowardsion. Is that right? I think that's our <laughs> website. It's been so long since I said it. Speaking of our financial supporters, thank you so much. We really appreciate you. We really need the editing software that your financial contributions pay for, so we appreciate it. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much for listening. See you next time.